All right, good morning, church. Good morning. So my sermon title this morning is uh, Why Keep Praying or Why Pray? It's part of the ongoing series of lessons to myself. Um, I was having problems with my prayer life, and I found a good sermon titled Why Keep Praying by Mike Mazzalongo, the guy we do our morning study around. So I thought it would be used use to help myself and anyone else who need encouragement with their prayer life. And then it happened. Road rage. <laughs> okay, so I thought I was pretty much over that. I'm not having that issue anymore. I listen to good Christian music when I drive. I stay calm and cool and collected until that big old truck pushed me right out of my lane. <laughs> so I don't need to go into the rest of that story and what happened, but the point being I lost control of my anger and engaged in non-saint-like behavior. And for those who are not familiar with what I've said before, I like to call us not Christians, but saints, because that's what the Bible refers to us as saints. So they're interchangeable. So why do you think I should keep on praying? <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, I, I'm asking God, why, why should I keep praying? What should I pray about and everything else? And I realized I need God. I need to be praying to him. Amen. So maybe there's no humility in my game. Uh, it, why, if you were to ask me, I'd say I'm one of the humblest guys I know. Um, I'm so humble, I even brag about praying for others and not myself, which was maybe in part of my problem. And I believe God might be trying to tell me I need to pray for myself. You want to give the devil a foothold? Stop praying. Why keep praying? So after this, I felt pretty terrible, and I needed forgiveness. In John, 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This doesn't mean you post it on social media or tell your entire church or neighborhood that you, what you've done. Uh, it means first you go to God in humility and prayer, prayer and confess your sin. All of it. He already knows, so you might as well go ahead and face him, with, face him first with it. In my case, I was going to a men's Bible study that morning. And I, and you know, here I am, the good Christian, trying to do the good saint, trying to do the right thing and everything else. And uh, the devil got his foothold. And I felt terrible. And they knew it, because I didn't come in smiling and all happy. So um, this is an act of humility, in my case, really realizing how much I needed God. In 1 John 1 through 9, I read that. Okay. Um, so this only makes sense to ask for forgiveness. If someone does you wrong, aren't you more likely to forgive them if they apologize? If a child comes to you asking for forgiveness, isn't it better than the child that chooses to rebel? When we ask God for forgiveness, we are humbling ourselves to him. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6 reads, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The act of prayer is a practice in humility. Why keep praying? Jesus prayed. God, Son, our Savior, Lord, and Master prayed. I figure if Jesus had to pray, we definitely need to pray. And I'm not in the habit of telling people what they need to do. I try not to do that. But there's certain godly things that I'm pretty comfortable with saying you need to do. And I think one of them is pray. Now, I know Jesus taught us to pray when he recited what's commonly known as the Lord's Prayer for us, but here's Jesus' prayer in John 17. And this is pretty profound to me, and you know, it's funny how you read the Bible and sometimes things come enlightened to you where they hadn't been before, but Jesus started this prayer by praying for himself. John 17, 1 through 5, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. 
Now this is eternal life, that they know how the only true God and Jesus, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you have gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. He prayed for himself adamantly. Right after this, in, for, in John 17, 6, 19 through 19, Jesus prays for his disciples. And for, I won't read that whole part. But then in John 17, 20 through 25, he goes on his, for his prayer, in his prayer, and prays for us. And then this part of his prayer for us is too important not to recite, so I'm going to do that. So this is John 17, 20 through 25. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, through the world, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and they will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and in that I myself may be in them. So Jesus, this is a whole thing about unity, and I thought that it was real important to read that. And But that's God's prayer, or Jesus' prayer. He started praying for himself, then prayed for the disciples, and then he prayed for us. So it's a good um, way to look at it, because, you know, again, I was talking about not praying for myself. Um, that's, again, I bragged about that, the fact that I don't usually pray for myself. And so I thought later on, what the, the audacity of me to think that I don't need prayers, because I'm doing okay. You've got to be careful of that. I have to be careful of that. Jesus prayed for himself and others. He also prayed alone. Luke 5, 16 reads, But Jesus often withdrew lonely places and prayed. And as indicated by this passion, he passage, he did this often. In Jeremiah 42, the people promise to listen to whatever God tells the prophet Jeremiah. They said to Jeremiah, May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we not act in accordance with everything the Lord your God sends us, sends you to tell us. Whether it is favorable or unfavorable, we will obey the Lord your God to whom we are, send, to whom we are sending you, so that if, we, if it will go well with us, for we will obey the Lord our God. Now it came about at the end of ten days, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. So, and the answer was for these people not to go to Egypt. What had happened in Jeremiah 41 is the um, Babylonians had taken over the people and they'd put a Babylonian leader in there and the rebels went and killed the Babylonian leader. So the um, people were afraid to stay in Babylon or in their hometown because the Babylonians were ruling. and they just killed their, one of their leaders. So they were asking Jeremiah, should we flee and go to Egypt or not? So the answer was not to go to Egypt, but to remain in Judah, and God would protect him. The Jews refused to listen and sought protection in Egypt because they feared man and not God, and, uh, or didn't trust in God, and as a result suffered the consequence of not listening to God. Okay, fine, that's a, a whole lesson in that, not listening to God and asking him for help and then ignoring him. But the point I wanted to make is about the last verse there, and now it came about at the end of 10 days that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. So if Jeremiah is a good and faithful servant of God, which he had been proven to be, and really realizing God already knew the answer that he was going to give him, why does he wait, make him wait 10 days for the answer? You know, that's the part that, that befuddles me. Um, 
he, here's a couple ideas why he encourages us to keep praying and wait a long time before the answer comes. Because I don't know about you, I've prayed for a lot of things for a long time, and I don't get the answer. Now, I've been praying for a long time. I've been a Christian since 19, oh, I gotta remember, 89 or so. I think that's when I got baptized before I came back from overseas. And um, in that process, I've been praying for some, some things for a long time. And you know, now, what's that, 30 some, 34 years later, okay? Some things seem to be coming to fruition, believe it or not. And I'm kind of like, maybe this is gonna work out after all, you know? <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it pays to keep praying. And I know that, but sometimes, again, I, I just don't see it. instant gratification. So here's a couple ideas why that might be. Um, waiting is good discipline. In Isaiah 40, 27 through 30, why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, may my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? So in other words, he seems to be ignoring me. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary, tired or weary, and is understanding no one can his understanding no one can fathom he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak even youths grow, tri youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength they will soar on wings like eagles they will run and not grow weary they will walk and not be faint the person in this verse thinks that God does not hear his prayer and is unaware of his problems. He is tired of waiting. He is growing impatient. Isaiah explains that the discipline of waiting upon the Lord, what the discipline of waiting upon the Lord will do for him. Waiting helps an infant grow strong and overcome his enemies, whoever or whatever they are. Isaiah reminds this tired, impatient person that God is not like him. He does not get tired or impatient when things don't happen right away. And I'm reminded of getting my college degree. When I got my college, I got that piece of paper. That felt really good. But I also remembered, you know, it was kind of a, a letdown in the end because what I realized was it was the whole journey of getting it that was of value. That piece of paper, sure, that would hopefully get me a better job or whatever, but it was the journey. And if you think about your life, um, the journey was the important part of the whole the value of it, I guess you could say. And I think that sometimes God knows what's going to happen, and he wants you to experience that journey so you can learn from it. And then maybe even your prayer would, the answer would be no, and you can understand why. So that's part of the, um, the discipline that he's trying to teach us. Um, number two, we may not be ready to understand God's will. Imagine that. Praying to God, it's not like buying something from a vending machine. Um, you make the right selection, put in the right change, and bingo, you get your candy. Um, God doesn't work like that, and that's probably a good thing. For example, Abram and Sarah desired and prayed for a child most of their married life, but their prayer was answered only when she was 90 years old. Both she and Abram were not ready in matters of faith when they first began to ask God for a child. The fact that she had a child at 90 years of age served God's purpose better than if she had had one at 19. And my thought was any woman could have had a child at 19. Okay, 90 is a whole nother story, right? She could have had a 19, but the birth of 19 would not have created a glory that it did when she had the child at 90. Another example, and I wasn't aware of this, and it's interesting that Paul the Apostle desired in his prayers and strategy to go to Asia and preach the gospel. And God prevented it, limited it, thwarted his plans, and refused his prayers in this thing. Now, Paul didn't realize that by going west, he would establish a church in the dominant culture of the future. Because Christianity went west instead of east, it became the largest organized religion in history. As opposed to if he had gone the way he wanted to, that whole thing might not have happened. And as much as he wanted it, he got stopped. And again, I think it's important when we pray to remember it's God's will be done and trust that the fact that his will is being done is the better outcome. When we pray and say that we are ready to accept God's will, we must be ready at the, it, 
be radically different than our own. It is important to pers persevere in prayer because if we do, God will not simply answer the prayer. He will reveal his will to us. This is much more important. Number three, perseverance in prayer reveals the quality of our faith. James says, I will show you my faith by my works in James 2.18. And that's part of what we're studying in our Bible study about our behaviors, our controlling our tongue, etc. When we read this, we usually think of good works and those things done to help others in holy and dedicated lifestyle. But prayer, prayer is also a work of faith. To direct our words to Christ, this is faith. To believe that he hears and he answers, that is faith. And to continue to do so over and over again, to wait patiently for an answer, this is a showing that our faith is sincere. This is a work of faith. That we pray to God in Jesus' name shows that we believe the right things in the right way, that we continue to do so, that we persevere in it the way of showing that our belief is not only accurate, but it, that it's strong and real and goes deeper than just our lips. Sometimes God leaves us in prayer for a long time because he's testing and shaping of our faith is more important than answering our prayer. A good example of this is Paul's constant prayer to God to remove the thorn from my flesh. That he was suffering from, uh, that's in 2 Corinthians. We never find out what the thorn was, and until that moment, Paul says that God had not answered his prayer. However, Paul's persistent prayer had helped him grow in faith to the point where he was ready to suffer with his thorn regardless of God's answer. When we become bored repeating our prayers at meal times or prayers during worship, when we become discouraged when our prayers are not answered the way we want or not answered at all, we need to remember the important reason for the persistent prayer. It is more important that we are faithful people than a people where our prayers are always answered or quickly answered. Persevering in prayer may not always produce a satisfying answer, but it always is a sign of sincere faith. When Jesus returns, it won't matter what we are praying about so long as he finds us persevering in it. So, and if you're not ready for his return, you should probably think about doing so. After Christ was crucified for the people in the Bible, they realized their mistake and asked what they must be do to be saved. The response was repent and be baptized. So if you'd like to know more about this, please identify yourself by coming forward during the next hymn or talk to one of our church members. We're more than willing to help somebody find their way to God's savings grace. Let's all stay. Oh, I'm sorry. OK.